Hi guys, here we are. We're going to, I, I'm in my classroom filming this by the way, because what I needed to have was here on this computer. So we are going to start our um, learning of what the scripture has to say about the beginning of life and the beginning of the world. So I'm hoping that you can see this fine. Um, and I'll be, sometimes I'll be in the picture and sometimes I won't. Oh, there's the bell. It's time for us to go to lunch. So um, this is going to probably take, probably do about two days worth of this. Um, so we're going to start today and we're starting with the days of creation as told in Genesis 1 and 2. So you might want to get your Bibles out um, because we are definitely going to be looking at the Word of God as we go through this. So here we go. So to start with, who wrote the book of Genesis? Are you answering me? Did you say Moses? Because that's what most people would say. So let's see. Hebrew tradition states that Moses wrote the first five books of the Old Testament. However, nowhere in Genesis does Moses claim to be the author. In fact, nowhere in the entire Bible does it say that Moses wrote the book of Genesis. It tells us that he wrote other books of the Bible, but it never tells us that he wrote the book of Genesis. So we don't know for a fact who wrote the book of Genesis. Traditionally, people believe that it was Moses. We'll see what other information there is. So here are some other theories as to who wrote the book. Um, first is that maybe it was word of mouth, that um, from the beginning it was passed down by word of mouth to Moses. That leaves lots of room for errors, and we know that there are no errors in the Bible, but Moses wasn't there when Genesis happened. So, especially at the beginning of it, the only person there at the beginning was God. So maybe God told Moses what to write. Maybe the information had been passed down over years, and that's how Moses knew what to write. But that does leave room for errors. Maybe it was by revelation. Maybe God revealed Genesis directly to Moses by the Holy Spirit. We know that's possible. That happened for lots and lots of books in the Bible, particularly the book of Revelation. Or let me move these up now. There's something called the tablet theory. Now, this is one you've probably never heard of before, so let me move out of the picture so you can see it. It is the book of Genesis was originally written on tablets, this is true, in an ancient script by the patriarchs. The theory is that Adam, Noah, and people all the way up to Jacob were, who were eyewitnesses to the events are the ones who actually wrote the tablets. And then Moses was the compiler of the book as we know it today. Nowhere in scripture does it say that Moses actually wrote the book of Genesis. There's over 200 references to Genesis throughout the Bible, and Moses is never credited as the author. Now, the reason that's important is because Moses is credited as the author. Like in the book of Hebrews, it tells us, it talks about Moses writing the book of Exodus. So it does tell us in other parts of the Bible that Moses wrote other books, and God is consistent so why didn't he tell us that Moses wrote Genesis? Maybe because he didn't. Maybe he compiled the books. That's, there's a difference between compiling the books and writing the books. So we move on. The tablet theory continues. There are 40 verses that reference Exodus through Leviticus and Moses is credited in all of them in all 40 verses. All of the other books of the Bible were written as or close to the time of the events. God is consistent. So it doesn't make sense really that Moses wrote the book of Genesis. So, so let's look at these consistent ancient tablet structure. When you look at the structure of the ancient tablets, there's always a title, there's a body of text, and there's something called a colophon. So here's one, There's, this one is found in Genesis 11 times, 
sorry, in the book of Genesis, I said that completely wrong. But we find this 11 different times in the book of Genesis. So you're asking, okay, Miss Salkill, I know what a title is. I know what a text, the body of the text is, but what is a colophon? Ah, I'm so glad you asked. Let me tell you. A colophon is a recurring phrase. It could be the name of the owner or the writer, the scribe. It could be the witness or the seal. It could be a date. Um, there's an example in Jeremiah 39.2, and I should have had my Bible open to Jeremiah. So hang on. Jeremiah, hang on, take me a second to get there. 39.2, apologies. I'm in Jeremiah, just trying to get 39. Okay, Jeremiah 39, verse 2 says, In the 11th year of Zechariah, in the fourth month, in the ninth day of the month, the city wall was breached. That's a colophon. It's giving you an exact day and a place even. So a colophon is going to have a recurring phrase or it's going to actually name the, uh, the writer or it's going to give a date. So let's look at Genesis chapter 5 verse 1 and it says, in this book, this is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day when God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. The most significant finding about these tablets was that at the end of most of the tablets, there was a, cur a recurring phrase. These are the generations of. This is the recurring phrase. And it happens 11 times in the book of Genesis, which makes you think that that's a colophon. That sounds like a colophon. And if it's the book of the generations of Adam, then Adam would be the author there. So let's look at some of the tablets. If we really break it apart, tablet one begins with Genesis chapter one, verse one, and goes through Genesis chapter two, the beginning part of verse four, and it says the generations of the heavens and earth. Now this is the most exciting thing of all because it tells us that maybe God wrote Genesis chapter one. That it was, and we know that God can write. He wrote the Ten Commandments, right? He wrote it on stone. So what if Genesis 1 was actually not written by Moses, but was actually written by the only eyewitness that was there, and that was God. Wow. What if God himself wrote Genesis chapter 1? Or maybe he dictated it to Adam, and Adam wrote it. I don't know, but isn't that cool to think of? The second tablet starts, picks up with verse 4 of chapter 2, goes through chapter 5, and it says the book of the generations of Adam. So Adam probably was the author of the second tablet. The third tablet says that from Genesis 5-1 to 6-9, the generations of Noah. So who wrote that one? Yeah, probably Noah. He was there. He was the eyewitness to it. Tablet 4 from Genesis 6 to Genesis 10 says the generations of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Who are Shem, Ham, and Japheth? Noah's sons, right. So this tablet was probably had four different authors, Noah and his three sons. Then we have our fifth tablet, which is just Genesis 10 to 11. The generations of Shem. Who wrote that one? Probably. Probably Shem. Then Genesis, the sixth tablet, probably written by Terah. The seventh tablet, written by Ishmael. The eighth tablet, written by Isaac. The ninth tablet, by Esau. The tenth tablet, by Esau. The eleventh tablet, by Jacob. Now, am I saying that Moses had nothing to do with it? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. Moses probably took 
these 11 tablets and compiled them together to give us the book of Genesis. So yeah, Moses was probably very much involved, but probably was not really the author of the book of Genesis. Now here's the deal. And, and this is big for what we're gonna talk about the rest of the year in this. And that is that there will always be things that we don't understand and that we cannot explain. God knew this. It says in John 3, 12, if I have told you of earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe of heavenly things? God is saying, look, I have told you things that you can see with your own two eyes and you don't even believe that. So why on earth do I think you're going to believe things that you cannot see? You're not. You're not going to believe it. So we have to believe on faith and we have to believe what he has told us and what he has explained to us. All right, so here we go. We're starting our day. So get your Bible out. Go to Genesis chapter 1. Usually I would have y'all read this, but I'll read it. So um, we're doing the first day, okay? So it says, chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning, God, hmm, who was there in the beginning? God. God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. There was, I've just lost my place. And there was evening, and there was morning one day. Hmm. Okay, so what all was created on the first day? Well, we have time. Why was time? How do we have time? How was time created? There was evening. There was morning. One day. By the way, let's make sure we understand how the Hebrew day went. It went from sunrise. I mean, I'm sorry. That's us. Sunset to the next sunset was a day. That's 24 hours but that was their day. So they didn't go from midnight to midnight or sunrise to the next sunrise. Their day started at sunset. So that was their first day. So time was created. What else was created? How about the heavens? God created what? He created the heavens. God created the earth. Light, he said, let there be light. He separated the light from the darkness. So we have a difference now. We have light, time that's light, and time that's dark. He also created water because it said, the earth was formless and void and darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. So at this point, the whole earth was water. We have light was called day. It got a name on day one, and the darkness was called night. It got a name. Now, sometimes you're going to hear people say, well, I believe in creation, but maybe a day wasn't 24 hours. Okay, that's called the day-age theory. Mm, it's a problem. Um, God clearly defined the length of a day on the very first day. Remember, all of this was done in an instant. All God had to do was speak. He spoke his spoken word and the world came into being. Psalm 33, six and nine says, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. He spoke and it was done. That's powerful. That's powerful. I want to look at this word heavens for just a second because it's plural. So I want you to know that on day one, God created three heavens. Um, the first was the atmosphere, like our atmosphere, where the birds are. Probably didn't have all the atmospheric gases yet. There's a reason I'm saying that, but the space was there. 
Um, the second heaven is outer space, where all the other planets were there. Was anything in that space yet? No. And then the third heaven is heaven, like God's heaven, God's place. So that's what that word means. There's three of them. Um, let's see, is there anything else I want to touch on? I, I do want to touch on the length of the day real quick. So let me set my Bible down. I'm stepping out of the picture for a second. And I'm going to Exodus chapter 20. So you can move there also. And verse um, 9. Exodus chapter 20, verse 9. Now, if you look at Exodus chapter 20, this is the um, Ten Commandments that God literally did write with his own hand. So let's look at verses 9 through 11. It says, this is a commandment written by God in God's hand. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. In it, you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or female servant, or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Okay, so in this commandment, we are commanded to work for six days and rest on the seventh day. You will meet people in your life who say, oh man, but you know what? The word day probably was just a reference, just kind of an idea, is something that we've come up with. It wasn't a 24 hour day. The word day, they would say, maybe it meant millions, a million years. Maybe every day was a, mi a million years, and there we've got six million years right there, boom. Or maybe it was more than that. Okay, listen, if you go back to the original language, the word day in Genesis chapter one is the exact same word as the word day in Exodus chapter 20. Same word, same meaning, same everything, so do you think that when God wrote the Ten Commandments and he used the word day and said, you shall work six days, did that mean that we are supposed to work for six million years before we have a day off? Are we supposed to work a year before we have a day off? Are we supposed to work six months before we take a day off? No, he meant six literal 24-hour days. Remember, all God had to do was speak and everything came into being. Ah, this is so exciting. Okay, that was day one. Let's move on to day two, the second day, which is in Genesis 1, 6 through 8. So let me read that for us. Then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse, and it was so. God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening and there was morning a second day. Okay, so what was created on day two? This one's pretty interesting. We have the expanse between the waters and he separated the waters. Okay, so here's, the, here's what we have here. You have earth, which at this point is only water. And God then, he says, he separated, he had waters above and waters below. So it's like he took the water and pulled it up and put it out somewhere in space. So there's water somewhere out there in space? That's crazy. And then he put a, a, a space, he put um, an expanse between them. Sometimes your Bible says firmament instead of the word expanse right there. But he separated the waters. This is, he's creating our atmosphere. Remember a minute ago I said there were three heavens and the atmosphere was one of our heavens, but it probably didn't have all the right gases in it yet. Okay, this is where he's putting all the right gases in our atmosphere. Because... Next, the next day, he's about to create living things, 
And so if he's gonna create living things, there has to be oxygen for them, right? So this is day two, it's when our atmosphere is being created. And now there's this water up in space somewhere. That's kind of crazy to think about. So that brings us to another theory. Lots of people try to make the Bible match old earth and it doesn't match very well. But there is a theory called the canopy theory and it is the belief that there is a canopy of water that was above the earth prior to the flood and that that's where the water for the flood came from. Well, there's no biblical or scientific support for that theory. The waters are above are high above the heavens. So the so-called canopy surrounding the earth doesn't work. So let's look, um, the waters below in verse nine and 10, it says, God calls the waters gathered together in one place under the heaven or firmament seas. So therefore, they, they can't be the so-called canopy. So we can't, this canopy theory isn't viable. There's no scientific evidence for it. There's no biblical evidence for it. So let's go to day three. I love day three. Day three is my favorite day. Ooh, it looks like day. Okay, so let's go. Verse nine it says, Then God said, Let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the gathering of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees on the earth, bearing fruit after their kind, with seed in them, and it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind, and God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, a third day. Hmm, okay. So what happened on day three? Well, he gathered the waters. So remember, at this point, up until this point, the entire earth was water, was seas. So he gathered all the waters and called them seas. And now dry land has appeared, and he calls that earth. And then vegetation bearing plants after their kind, after their kind, after their kind. An apple tree is only forever going to be an apple tree. It will bear apples. You're not going to get a lemon off of an apple tree ever, 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 never, never, never will that ever happen. There's a clear sequence of events here and God, I'm listening to the way, and God did not leave room for us to add anything to the sequence. Okay, y'all. Oh, this is so exciting, but I can't really get into why it's exciting until we get to day four, because this is really cool. Except, uh, one thing we need to add here on day three is I believe color, and I didn't put it on here, but I really think this was when color was also created. Because if you have plants, well, plants aren't black and white. Plants have color. There's a color to plants. I just see it. Now, you know, it wasn't just God. It was God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They were all three there creating. Oh, man, I can just see it. I can just see God the Father looking. I, I just like to picture them having conversations as they're doing this. And I can just see the Father sitting there looking. Watch this, guys. Son, take note. I'm about to do something really cool. Mm, ah, look, that's yellow. I just created yellow. Look at that flower. That's yellow. And I see the Holy Spirit going, oh, wait a minute, bing, oh, there's red, I created red. And then Jesus going, oh, wait a minute, guys, oh, wait just a minute, bing, oh, look, there's blue. I Can't you just see it? They're just having all this much fun, creating all these different plants and all these different colors, and oh, man, oh, it was an exciting day. But the real excitement of that day doesn't come until you see day four, because day four is real, really gets exciting. So let's look at day four, verse 14. Verse 14 says, then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. 
and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on earth, and it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and to govern the day and the night and to separate the light from the darkness and God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning, a fourth day. Oh man, y'all. Oh, this is gonna get really good. So let's, okay, I've gotta calm down here for a second. Let's just look at what was created. All right, let's see it. We have the sun, the greater light, the moon, the lesser light, all the stars, seasons, because it says let them be for signs and seasons, and all the other planets. So basically the entire universe, everything else that's in the universe was created on day four. Okay, again, I just see it. I just see God, it says he placed them. So I just see him going, okay, there's the sun. Let's put the sun, right? Yep, that looks good. What do you think? Sun, S-O-N. <laughs> what do you think about that? Yeah, that looks good, right? You think that's good? Okay, now let's do, let's do Mercury here. Let's put, let's see, here's the sun. So let's come out just a little bit, right? You think Holy Spirit, that's good? That's good with you? Yeah, let's put Mercury and then, oh yeah, there's, there's Venus and, there's earth, and he, he goes through and he places them all. He places them, y'all. And then he does it in a way that we can actually live here on this planet. Because if we were any closer to the earth or any or to the sun or any farther away from the sun, we could not live here. We are the exact distance we need to be for life to survive on planet earth because he placed us. And then I just see it. He's looking at it and he's sitting back and he's going, wait a minute. Maybe, maybe Jesus did this one. I don't know. Maybe. Dad, Dad, wait a minute. We've got to do one more thing. And he, and he puts his hand on earth and he goes, watch this. And he gave earth a tilt. Why do we have seasons? Because we have a tilt. So when was the earth's tilt given? On day four. Now, I said day three was my favorite day, but you had to wait to get to day four. Oh, y'all. Day three was plants, all the plants. Now, remember I said, you're gonna meet people in life who are gonna try to tell you that a day was more than 24 hours. Maybe a day was thousands of years, millions of years, billions of years. They're gonna try to tell you that, oh, but God, oh, he's so clever. And he just quietly creates things in a way that will ruin man's ideas thousands of years later. Because he created plants the day before he played, created sunlight. What do plants need in order to live? Sunlight! Ding, 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 ding. You're so good. They need sunlight to live. If a day was not 24 hours, if a day was years and years and years, what would have happened to all those plants? Yes, they would have died because God created those plants to need sunlight. And then the very next day, he created the sunlight. Oh, but Miss Salkill, wait a minute. On day one, we have light, but we don't have the sun until day four. Oh, I'm glad you asked. I'm so excited. Now this one, I didn't go to theology school, so I can't prove this. This is my own personal thought. So go in your Bible to John chapter one. I went too far. I was in John, then suddenly ended up in Luke. Okay, here I am. John chapter one, verse one. It says, in the beginning, oh, does that sound familiar? Wait a minute, Genesis one, in the beginning, John one, in the beginning. The only difference is in Genesis one, it says in the beginning God, and in John one, it says in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, 
and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Who is the word? Did you say Jesus? I hope you did. Jesus is the word. Jesus is God. Jesus has been with God since the beginning. Jesus has always been there. He is also called the light. So what if on day one, when God created light, his creation of light was looking over at his son and saying, son, turn on your light. And Jesus went, Wah! and his light was shining forth until day four when they created the sun. Is that the light for day one, two, and three? I don't know. It's kind of fun to think that maybe it is. Let's look at my picture here. We have the waters above, but now we have the earth and we have dry land and seas. We have the greater light. Sorry, it doesn't look much like a sun, but it's the best I could do, so don't make fun of me. And we have the lesser light, the moon, and then we have all the stars and planets. So all of this is in the heavens, but we still have that water above. Psalm 148.4 says, Praise him, highest heavens, and the waters that are above the heavens. Guess what? That water is still there. So that ruins the canopy theory of, hey, the water became, the water above became the water for the flood. No, because the book of Psalms was written well after the flood, and it said, the waters that are in the heavens, that are above the heavens, it's still there. So what if we could get a spaceship to go far enough out to find the waters? I don't know. I don't know. Probably not. And so I thought we'd end today with just this beautiful, beautiful picture. This was um, taken from the Hubble telescope. It is um, a small cloud. It's one of the Milky Way's closest galactic neighbors, the Magellan Cloud. Isn't that absolutely gorgeous? We'll pick up with day five tomorrow. Love you. Bye.